the company never built an auditing system. And so it goes back to the problem of when an advertiser wants to know, where did my ads run? They never built a system to give you that answer. The automation was built in, in such a one-sided way, it didn't provide for any effective auditability just from the beginning. And that the fact that they could not build that retroactively is a, an indictment of how badly designed the system was from the start and how unaccountable it was engineered to be. Welcome to the third episode of the Big Tech Podcast. I'm David Scott. And I'm Taylor Owen. We've made it to episode three, Taylor. <laughs> we have. I can't believe it. So if you're joining us for the first time, I encourage you to also, after listening to this episode, uh, go and listen to the first two. In the first episode, we spoke to Rana Faruhar about her book, Don't Be Evil, and how big tech companies have had unimaginable impacts on our society over the last decade. And then in the second episode, we chatted with Kate Klonick uh, about her work on Facebook's oversight board, or what they call the Supreme Court. Uh, so please go check them out and subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done so already. Now on to today's episode. As you heard at the very start, we are speaking with Professor David Carroll about data privacy and how platform companies have been caught using our data. Yeah, so David's a pretty interesting character in the whole Cambridge Analytica story. He's an academic who was studying the space from a kind of marketing perspective and ended up becoming a legal activist trying to chase how Cambridge Analytica used his data. And in so doing, ended up the character in a Netflix documentary. Yeah, he featured as a kind of a key character in The Great Hack on Netflix. David Carroll, coming up next on Big Tech. Professor David Carroll from the Parsons School of Design in New York joins us from New York. Welcome to the show, David. Hello. So the, the popular narrative is that, you know, it, this was a scandal where Facebook allowed numerous organizations access to the data of around 87 million people. But it's actually a much larger problem than that and involves the entire information ecosystem. You've said that it goes beyond just information and right to the heart of how business is conducted in the global economy and where corporate responsibility lies. Could you start by describing to our listeners what is the core structural problem that you see with online advertising? So for some reason, we've decided that the ability to target ads efficiently to save money on advertising is the most important thing in the world. And it sounds like an exaggeration, but... It doesn't seem to be that the business imperative at the core of this was the perception among businesses that they waste money on advertising and any mechanism to make them feel like they're wasting less money on advertising is justifiable, even if it means a lot of downstream effects. And so I think we're at a stage where we're realizing there are a lot of externalities to that mentality and it's probably not worth it, and that they're probably not saving as much money and reducing as much waste as they think they are. There's an ecosystem of data collection that is a part of this, and there is the product that's being sold on top of that ecosystem, right? So the ability to micro-target or to influence behavior. So how is that capacity being pitched to anyone who might want to influence the behavior of anybody else, whether it's a marketer or a political campaign or what have you? Well, certainly um, the model is pitched to commercial and political clients almost equivalently that the same tools and techniques to uh, sell skin creams and ski vacations are used to select and mobilize or even demobilize voters and all the tools are used in very similar ways so that we haven't established any firewall between the advertising industrial complex and the electioneering complex and arguably even the military industrial complex. And so because we haven't established any reasonable boundaries between these worlds, it really gets overlapped in really troubling ways. Um, so the holy grail of advertising is to predict our behavior with a level of precision so that our behavior can be anticipated and influenced to win the bets on our predicted behavior. So 
predicting that you will go to a particular coffee chain next week and order a particular coffee beverage and use a particular incentive program to pay for that. And then what happens when we get nudged to win that bet on our future behavior? The notion that you know our activity is being traded as a derivative, that really starts to threaten our sense of autonomy when we don't even know that these bets are being made against us. When did it change, David? When did things shift? Because I, you know, you remember the the early two thousands. Even it felt like social media was this fun thing to be on, and there was a time there where I remember Facebook was facing a lot of heat because they weren't generating enough revenue, and people didn't know how they were going to start generating revenue. Was it was it mobile? Was when was the the pivot to to so aggressively and exponentially improve their targeting? Well, it started. Even, you know, this has been a, a process that's been going on for uh, 20 years. The sort of original promise of digital advertising on the Internet was to eliminate the waste, that the Internet allowed precision and attribution of whether or not ads worked. And it's been a gradual process of building up an extremely complicated ad tech industry of hundreds of companies that most consumers have never heard of, that have been collecting and buying and selling our personal data for the auctions that occur in high speed every time you visit a page. The ads that display are the result of these high speed auctions. So that you know process built up and it largely you know ate itself alive and triggered um, people installing ad blockers. And in 2014, I was trying to warn the industry that. People were installing ad blockers not just because they thought ads were annoying and they were made annoying because the data that they produced encouraged more annoying behavior, but that people also had some privacy anxiety bubbling below the surface. But the industry insisted that nobody cares about their privacy anymore so they can keep on doing what they're doing. And I said, no, this is really going to blow up in your faces someday. I wonder if uh, in that arc, how much focus and... uh blame, depending on how you you spin it, that Sheryl Sandberg plays in this. I mean, she developed this for the targeting model and the financial model for Google and then did it for Facebook as well. And it it feels like if you're looking for a a through line through the narrative of that model that Dave was mentioning, that's probably it, right? Indeed. uh, The fact that she created the hyper-targeting business model for Google and then did it for Facebook she single-handedly influenced this business in such a particular way. And her justification for it is that she has enabled small businesses to afford attention that was previously unaffordable. And her defense is that she has enabled small business in a way that would not be possible otherwise. In many ways, she could be attributed for, for that but the, um, the externalities of that are the aspects that she struggles to have good responses to. I will put the blame on a lot of other places beyond just Sheryl Sandberg. I can recall working in a very large news organization where, you know, I, what I call the video industrial complex. So after programmatic advertising and all of these algorithms had dropped the price of the CPM so low, that left publishers scrambling to find replacements all of a sudden, oh, hey, there's video with a a $30 CPM. And you had publishers, you had agencies and advertisers, and you had the platform companies all kind of, you know, complicit in this false notion that video was going to create the next wave of revenue generation. And if any one of us stopped the musical chairs and said otherwise, we were off the, the boat. You know, it was amazing to watch at that time with video in particular, how all of these players in this ecosystem were just rowing in one direction. Yeah, I would agree that that the it goes back further than Sheryl Sandberg and even really to the decision to build an economy around the metric of the impression, which is a measurement that has no scarcity attached to it, that that it's. It doesn't measure a finite resource, even though human attention is a finite resource. And so it created a race to the bottom 
for the all sides of the industry and all these conflicts of interest that is very reminiscent of the financial crash of uh, you know, 10 years ago now, the mortgage crisis, the notion that um, everything can be rebundled and repackaged in very complicated instruments that nobody understands. And a similar moment happened before and around the election where big brands asked, where are my ads running when reporters publish stories that ads for Mercedes were appearing in YouTube videos for violent extremists? And the ad tech companies didn't have a good answer to where their ads were running because nobody bothered to figure that out. And it's similar to in the credit crisis when the investors asked the banks, so where are these mortgages? And the banks really couldn't tell them because everything had been automated into this super complex arbitrage scheme. And so the way that the impression metric just lend itself to arbitrage and, and a level of arbitrage that is like, in, it's, you can't even map it out. It's, it's an impenetrable automated algorithmic structure that has no transparency, could have got us into this mess, and it doesn't even measure anything meaningful. So we built this whole thing that's ultimately quite meaningless. How do you now feel about the public's uh, willingness to engage in these difficult and complicated conversations, uh, whereas before, uh, you know, it probably felt like you were yelling into a tornado. Yes. For example, when, when I would say to publishers and ad tech people that people are installing ad blockers because they care about their privacy, they would laugh at me. And in some ways, you can't blame them because they were making their decisions based on what is called by some the privacy paradox or by others the trade-off fallacy, this idea that People say they care about their privacy, but then they don't behave in such a way that shows that, that we share stuff and we, we sign up for services. And so I'm feeling very positive and optimistic and reassured now because, you know, things like the reaction to the film The Great Hack shows that when the problem could be made into a narrative that regular people could understand, that it reassured me that people really do care about their privacy. They just don't know how to care about their privacy. And there's not, they're not given mechanisms to do so. And we are, yeah, we are up against false choices to begin with. A very common response to the film is deleting Facebook. But that, you know, do, do those people also delete Instagram and WhatsApp? And do they, you know, have to make great sacrifices in order to make that choice? And is that choice even doing anything? So I, I think that uh, the, the, the response to the film is, is the, for me, the most personal validation that it was worth pursuing this and it was worth not being discouraged and that people would come around as soon as they could understand. I really empathize with this notion of... Uh the uphill battle this has been over the last number of years and just how much the public discourse has, has changed in large part because of the, some of the campaigns you've been involved with and the activist work you've been involved with. I wonder if we're getting across the actual nature of the democratic threat here. And and I worry about this a bit because of what's just happened in Canada with the Canadian election here. So as you know, there were a lot of people, including yourself, warning the Canadian government that there was going to be a whole set of threats to the election. And I think we, we can talk more about the policy side of this, but the government did do some some smart things, I think, in response to that concern. And I was involved in a very big monitoring effort of the election, where we are trying to capture this digital discourse online and uh, see if it was changing people's behavior. And the thing we found was not that there was an acute foreign interference or that some of the easy manipulative tools that we know have been used in previous elections were present. I, I worry it was more just two things. One, there was a, just a degrading of the public discourse, right? That because we were having this conversation about an election in the medium we were having it in, it was more inflammatory. It was more divided. The electorate was more polarized, right? And those don't have an individual cause. Those are kind of a, a function of the ecosystem. 
That's how I would describe it. And the second piece is that there's probably a lot of stuff that was happening that we just can't see, right? That it's embedded in the design of these tools and how certain voices get amplified and how certain people can be targeted. So I, I guess like as you see these elections unfold and you see the nature of the democratic threat evolving, how has how is your thinking on that moved on? Yeah, I think one of the ways that people have started to see that the manipulation is right there on the surface. It's not necessarily, you know, this impenetrable, illegible algorithm that we can't even understand, but just it's right in the user interface that the the design of the UI is manipulative and creates perverse incentives and rewards bad behavior and trains us to behave in ways that we wouldn't behave if it wasn't for the interface. So a lot of the blame, you know, is in the the discipline of UX, the discipline that I most closely associate with, the people who are designing the front end, um, that there was no ethics in this industry. A lot of times it gets blamed on the engineers, but the designers have a lot of have a lot of responsibility here. And as uh, Roger McNamee says in his book and in the film, that it's, you know, the same techniques of casinos and slot machines. And this was all driven, you know, by the data. It was driven by, like, you know, what interface would create the chart that would please the business people. And that is the same mentality that comes from ad tech. It's what technology can we deploy that makes the chart that makes people spend money? And that's the whole motivation. There's nothing else. <laughs> and it creates these t terrible machines that are just trying to make the chart go up at all costs without any other considerations. And so when it comes to elections, we've built this machine that prioritizes engagement, whatever engagement works, doesn't matter, make the chart go up. And so we inadvertently tapped into our lizard brains and our sort of inability to think clearly and be manipulated at multiple levels on the surface, in the content itself, the algorithms that are selecting it, the machines that are measuring it, feeding it back to us. It's really multi-layered. And so this idea that people are coming to terms with that the interface itself privileges emotion that is negative and uh, moves conversation towards toxicity because toxicity is rewarded and the opposite of toxicity is not only not a re uh, rewarded, but is kind of squelched out of the, the flow of, of experience. And so it's quite tragic. Do you think that's changing our politics? It seems to be. Um, it's hard to make a causation. There's lots of mostly just correlation. But in certainly the way that the um, advertising complex was built to sort us into our categories without knowing what our categories are. That was the foundation. And then from there, the recommendation engines were built to surface vast databases into a user interface, and those were biased towards engagement to move the chart up. And then the user interface to reward people right on the surface for engagement, again, to move the chart up. And it was never about health or intelligence or g goodness. It was just about greed and and metrics. One of the things you seem to see a lot, um, particularly in the research community, is some challenging to the questions of either how negative online advertising is or how effective it is, right? So you see that with kind of responses to the claims that Cambridge Analytica was making about the power of their profiling. Yeah, I think you saw it with the response to Twitter's ad ban, right? Where a lot of people were saying, look, like there's actually positive benefits to this micro-targeting ad campaign. And then they're not as effective as people are making them out to be. How do you how do you respond to those kind of context challenges, I guess, that are coming from the research community? In the big picture, I would hope that these are that that, you know, for example, Jack Dorsey is really just calling for a moratorium. And this would echo what the UK Information Commissioner has called for. She, Elizabeth Denham, called for an ethical pause on micro-targeting, and uh, the, the UK Association of Ad Agencies called for a moratorium on it. So 
I think when it's like the term banned is used, it's sort of too permanent. I think it's more of just like we need to pause this and figure out if it works and if it works how and if it needs reforms let's 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 be more thoughtful about it so i think it's more of like a pulling back and you can see the way that facebook is really trying to like litigate the the details of what they're going to allow what they're not going to allow uh in the public sphere so there is a large discomfort with it there are concerns that i have that i haven't seen the skeptics confront and so one concern that i haven't seen skeptics confront is that the definition of a political ad is much larger than the tradition and the existing research considers. The, the sort of recognizable political ad that everyone who's watching it knows it's a political ad, and at the end it even says, I approve this message. When we know that bad actors don't even stick to that format and do unattributable, untraceable influence campaigns that don't even fit into the framework or definition of a recognizable political ad, but they're doing it with the same data and intent as it would be otherwise. And so I don't think the research community has fully grappled how the boundaries of political advertising have exploded well beyond their capacity to measure it. The other thing is that the, the, the nature of the super sample has not really been confronted by the research community. I fear that companies, and not just Cambridge Analytica, have assembled a super sample of the entire population thanks to the voter rolls and enriched those and then created models that allow an entire electorate to be simulated in different computer models with the intent of modeling different outcomes and in more particular finding outliers in populations that then they can target by name and test messages on and test their receptivity to message and hone in on them and refine them and these people have no idea that they have been singled out and that they are in you know, undergoing an experiment and their behavior is in a feedback loop that is totally automated and, and being monitored and moderated in particular ways. There's just no awareness of this. And when elections are won on the narrowest of margins, we're seeing the popular vote skew from the electoral or the the polled vote. We see like the polls don't line up to the outcomes in different ways. We're seeing the popular vote is skewing farther and farther away, that the existing assumptions aren't working anymore. And so these are some of the aspects of the outcome that make me concerned that it shows that the political science community hasn't figured out what some operators might be doing. So that's a lot of the concern about the super sample. I suspect Taylor will disagree with me on this, but I, this is kind of where I find the conversation jumps a little bit uh, to where the culpability to me isn't necessarily on the platforms, but on the democratic institutions and the governance and, and the infrastructure we have in place. And what I mean by that is you know, it was ever thus, <laughs> you know, whether you had a platform, a, a social media platform or a newspaper or a fireside chat or a TV commercial or going back a train, people have been doing misinformation messaging. And it's mostly the parties and partisans themselves who do that, not necessarily foreign actors. And, and I, I wonder if sometimes when we look at this and, and we assess it through the prism of platforms, are we not simplifying it too much and, and absolving everybody else of their responsibility? Yeah, I agree with that. When I talk about this stuff, it, it can sound like I am attributing a single cause, but I tend to take the position that the answer is all of the above, that you, you can describe a condition that caused the outcomes and you could say, yeah, that contributed to it. And these all things contribute to them. And I don't think you can even tease them out because they're quite interconnected. And like yeah, you said, they're part of a long tradition of, you know, we can see in the cycles of history how, you know, the advent of the penny press and yellow journalism and the, uh, you know, the way that the patent medicine in industry was a, you know, a literal snake oil industry that was funding 
news. And then once a muckraker, you know, figured out that the whole thing was a scam, it caused the uh, creation of the Food and Drug Administration and sort of this relationship between news production, propaganda, fraudsters, scammers, the need to regulate, the role of journalists to poke at what's paying their own salaries. This is a repeating cycle and how it feeds into the political framework on the ad, you know the advantages of of weaponizing information. So yeah, I think these are all concerning, but for me the original concern that motivated me was the international nature of Cambridge Analytica that the political technology industry had become internationalized since the Obama campaign. And that, to me, seemed to cross a line that was no longer acceptable because just the basic principle that you would want elections to be domestic affairs exclusively. And that you know, fear was really borne out and then ultimately showed that the conduct was unlawful, at least according to U.K. law. And so the way that data is an atmosphere that doesn't respect boundaries and now that's interfering in the democratic process. It just, it's, a, it's an escalation of the problems that had already existed and is now just like fundamentally um, affecting national sovereignty and personal sovereignty in a way that I think is new and alarming. And we have to figure out how to discourage it. You mentioned the anecdote of the FDA and the penny press and, and all of that. And I wonder now, you know, when we, we talk about the data breaching and, and the next phase of it. Can you tell us about some of the more interesting bills being put forward in the United States to tackle some of these problems that we've outlined? One bill that's interesting that I don't know if it'll ever see the light of day, but it's something to be said that it's even been put forth is by Senator Dianne Feinstein of California called the Voter Privacy Act. It seems specifically to narrowly address the problem that Cambridge Analytica itself posed and, you know, gives voters rights to their voter profiles in very specific ways that we don't have right now. And is important because it like directly looks at the political technology industry as as something separate from the regular advertising industry, even though there's massive overlap. But one of the innovations of the bill is that it has the necessity for proactive disclosure. That is, candidates in super PACs would have to proactively tell voters that, that there's a file on them that exists and click here to validate your identity to see it. And this goes farther than the GDPR. Uh, this goes farther than Europe. And so seeing the moments when the U.S. decides to, in, in, to innovate and push the boundaries are very exciting to me because in many ways the GDPR is itself influenced by some aspects of U.S. privacy laws and so on. So there's an international influence of the legal constructs, which is important. And we get a bank statement every month. So why is it that unreasonable to think that we should get a data statement, whether it's monthly, quarterly, annually, that's, that's to be hashed out. But this idea that, you know, it's our data and it's not just the data that we supply, but it's the data that's inferred about us and the European model uh, um, considers inferred data, personal data, when it's attached to an identity. So all of these mechanisms are, are really interesting. So that's an interesting bill. Of course, uh, S- Senator Elizabeth Warren's Corporate Executive Accountability Act, which would make executives personally liable for these kinds of violations and crimes. It's very interesting to me because, you know, you can have the best privacy laws But if all it does is result in a fine, it really doesn't deter bad actors adequately. And in the case of the, you know... Well, Facebook stock went up after the $5 billion fine, right? Exactly. Fines don't seem to be an adequate deterrent on the top end where you have huge companies. And on the bottom end, I discovered in my quest for my data that bankruptcy and insolvency law is the problem on the other side, that... Small companies, medium companies can just go out of business when they get caught and they're, they're just shielded from liability. And indeed, like Cambridge Analytica LLC has been abandoned in bankruptcy court in New York and the FTC can't even really pursue them. And of course, you know, they basically got away with it under insolvency law in the UK. So we hit the limits on small companies on one problem and big companies on the other. And so the way that uh, Senator Warren's plan 
you know, really puts the onus on executives to run accountable companies. Otherwise, they go to jail. You know, Equifax, incredible breach. Just, you know, that it's so fr frustrating that the penalties are just laughable. It's a joke. Yeah, we put, we put executive liability on the financial sector, right? B many people feel that because no bankers went to jail after the mortgage crisis, nothing really changed. The U.S. is very reluctant to prosecute white-collar crime and very reluctant to put executives behind bars because we have such a deference to business. But data crimes are a thing now, and we have to realize that. I want to talk about the international piece of this in a minute, but focusing on, on the U.S., I mean, these federal bills, as you say, are seem fairly unlikely or would require a, a pretty big political change in the next few years. But it seems like the states are running with some of this stuff right now. So can California change American or even international behavior of some of these companies? There's certainly precedent for the California effect where a state law can affect a whole economy far outside of its boundaries. It's arguable that the entire Western Hemisphere's automotive industry is influenced, re regulated by a California state law that was really originated from dealing with the smog problem in Los Angeles. And uh, the auto emissions standards created a condition where it became economically infeasible to build a car that could not be sold or driven in the state of California. So the California Consumer Privacy Act could continue in that tradition. It makes no sense to build a service that one for Californians and one for everyone else. The GDPR has had effects of this already in the sense that the big platforms do have features to download your data. I dispute whether you're getting all your data, but that's, that's to be litigated. So the extraterritoriality of uh, data protection is, is in effect. And even the language, you know, is changing. We like to use the word privacy on this side of the world, where on the other side of the world, they, meaning uh, Europe, they use the word data protection instead. And to hear an FTC commissioner uh, use the phrase data protection is a really positive sign that we're moving away from a term that I would argue is completely meaningless, and the industry has really capitalized on the meaninglessness of the word privacy. The national regulatory approach, or even state level, I guess maybe California is a small exception just because of the location of some of these companies, is bumping into jurisdiction, right, and the scale of their markets. So in Canada, we had this ad transparency law come into effect six months before the election. And there was a degree of compliance from Facebook and Twitter. But Google simply said, we're leaving the market. It's not worth our investment to build the system to create an ad archive for the Canadian market alone which seems to be a clear <laughs> suggestion that we need international cooperation on this, right? Like you need markets that are big enough to force change. Do you see that happening? And do we need new institutions for that almost? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't feel like there's a, a, an appropriate international coordinating body for this kind of stuff right now. Yeah, the, the situation where Google pulled out was really interesting to me because it also yeah, il illustrated the market effects, but also illustrated that the company never built an auditing system. And so it goes back to the problem of like when an advertiser wants to know, like, where did my ads run? They never built a system to give you that answer. The automation was, was built in, in such a one-sided way. It didn't provide for any effective auditability just from the beginning, from the get-go. And that the fact that they could not build that re retroactively is an indictment of how badly designed the system was from the start and how unaccountable it was engineered to be. But my solicitor, Ravi Nayak, described to me that it's a similar problem to piracy, that, um, you know, from a legal standpoint, the world had to figure out how to deal with pirates, and it took international cooperation to achieve that. And there are data pirates out there uh, and the more that we succeed at regulating, they will just be pushed deeper and deeper into the shadows, become you know, even more difficult to detect and enforce. So indeed, international cooperation is the ultimate necessity. And that is difficult, especially as countries form a kind of splinter net 
where, you know, obviously China has its own internet and tech industry, and Russia is literally disconnecting from the internet, you could, you could say, and uh, data localization rules and so on are all sort of like this, uh, this, the same issues are sort of a pro and a con against keeping the internet a global network. I think a higher global standard will help everyone. It's been quite unfortunate to see how the publishers and ad tech companies have not respected the principle of the GDPR in implementing the cookie notices. I guess it was over-optimistic over to say they would, but the CCPA in California is going to push it in that direction any anyway. But then will it only work when you're in California? And so the stubbornness to keep the status quo in place is um, stickier than I thought it was going to be. The flip side of that disconnect between the capabilities that are being enabled in this system and the strength or potential strength of some government interventions, whether it be in Europe or in California or in Canada, is that I guess a lot of countries, particularly emerging markets and liberal leading regimes, it may be very well be the case that the speech policies of the platforms, for example, might be better than what's there right now, right? And at the very least, we're opening up this system that's a, a bit of a wild west for some of the behavior you're talking about in these countries, right? And how do you see that side of this debate playing out in emerging markets, in illiberal regimes? We've seen lots of stories about African countries where Cambridge Analytica-like behavior is kind of a free-for-all. Um, what do we do in those situations? The Cambridge Analytica whistleblower me memoirs by... Christopher Wiley and Brittany Kaiser talk in detail in ways that we haven't um, le learned about before, in particular about the work in Africa or just the general mentality of looking for places with weak enforcement and no laws and you know, the ability to infiltrate a country through its el elections in order to, you know, just exert a kind of colonialism. And Wiley, you know, explicitly talks about this as a new form of colonialism literally British aristocrats thinking they have a right to meddle in the affairs of other countries. And they're just using tools and tech and data and corruption to achieve it. So this is a huge problem, and it's important that countries like the U.S. and Canada uh, build upon what the EU has achieved to set a, a better example and to help um, the global south protect themselves and understand that this is a, it serves as a deterrent. One of the things that I was, you know, felt really positive about in the response to the film, The Great Hack, is that the response from people in South America and Africa was visceral and powerful. And there was an awareness of these things in those countries. And so there is an awareness, and the film did help to do that. And some of that is the sort of international reach of the Netflix itself that put the movie into media ecosystems all around the world in a way that few other, if any, platform can do. So I think that's a, a, a sign for a positive um, a, awareness, at least. Uh, what we do with that is a, a different story. But it's sort of similar that the, the problem of offshore companies and offshore tax shelters and uh, the sort of atmosphere quality of data, they're all sort of similar problems of international flow. And the worst Im expression of it is a kind of data piracy. That same international flow, you know, ironically, has actually helped you and this movement that you've become a real hero for a lot of people in terms of trying to gain access to your own data. And just curious, where will you take your campaign next if you do get a hold of your data, what happens if you don't get it? Where, where, are, where are we now? Well, at the end of the film, I do say that I'm, I sound quite pessimistic about getting my data back, but I'm feeling much more optimistic now. That was filmed a while ago, and since then it was described in a UK Parliament committee where the chair, Damien Collins, asked the Deputy Information Commissioner, what was the status? And they had described that they're making progress in their forensic investigation. So I'm looking forward to the final report from the ICO, which will provide at least a narrative of how Americans' data was collected, blended through different sources and algorithms, and 
we'll finally get a forensic picture of what happened by a truly neutral arbiter. You know, the information commissioner is quasi-independent. Of course, the information commissioner herself is a Canadian working for the UK. And so you sort of have a voice that has looked at forensic proof that has no skin in the game. So it's going to be really hard to dispute whatever they find. Uh, and it, it, Something that is so politicized will have a neutrality to it that will be really important to advance the conversation forward and to you know, have a, a, a second round of engagement between skeptics and people that are we're worried about this and we can have a, like a more informed debate about whether we should be worried about this or maybe it was overblown because now we really see what was on the servers or whatever it t- turns out to be. And then in terms of me being able to actually see my real data set, it will be very interesting to me to see what's there because I was not one of the 87 million people that Facebook notified that my data had been harvested through the API and the personality quiz. But it didn't have any effect on my standing because I had a file any- anyway. And it will be interesting to see if I have a psychographic model applied to me which would make sense given the company's scheme, which was to collect 87 million, match 30 million of those to voters, and the 30 million model was the statistical model applied to all 200 million plus registered voters. So the idea is everyone had a psychographic score, whether they were on Facebook or not. But in particular, I had my privacy settings set in Facebook to prevent my data from leaking because I was one of these rare privacy nerds who like dug deep into the settings and turned everything off. And that protected me from this particular event, but, you know, didn't protect me in the grand scheme of things. So I'm quite interested to see like as somebody who is privacy defensive and has been privacy defensive for some time, just how much data is in there anyway, and how potentially futile my efforts to opt out have been given the picture that we're able to create about me regardless. And so that's a particular aspect that I'm looking forward to being able to see and also showing that, you know, the fight can be won. It's ridiculous what it takes to win it. And hopefully people can see we need to make it much easier to do what I did. And that can be, um, you know, where I take it from there. We've talked to a lot of people on the show so far who have gone sort of a, through a transformation in their roles over the past number of years as this conversation about technology and society more broadly has evolved. And you've described sort of a bunch of your roles you've played, right? As a transition from an academic to becoming an activist, to becoming a legal activist, to becoming a you know, policy entrepreneur in this space too. And how do you how do you see that arc and where do you want that to go? Which of those roles are you are you most comfortable with and do you want to keep doing? Some of it is just being idiosyncratic myself and managing to create an academic profile that does not fit in a box. Luckily, being in an idiosyncratic university that doesn't require its faculty to fit into the normal definitions. So some of it's just being in the right place at the right time and being really privileged and really lucky to have found myself in this place. I don't know if I could have done what I did at a different university I don't know if I could have done what I did without the academic freedom, job security, the you know encouragement to be public practitioner, and so and not having the pressures that most of my colleagues in academia face. So some of it's just being lucky and just recognizing that luck and just trying to do the most I can with it. But at the same time, like being a shapeshifter is confusing and it's hard to characterize myself. It's hard to know who I am. And so I hope that uh, actually my identity will maybe stabilize from here on out. Cambridge Analytica probably knows it. Maybe if you get that data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that is really interesting to know. If, if, if when I get my profile, it tells me who I really am. There you go. <laughs> you know, David, um, I think what you are in a lot of ways as a journalist, you know, you don't have to be a professional journalist working every day to to do acts of journalism and your pursuit of your own data is to me a, a journalistic pursuit in the same way that many other journalists every day try to get to the truth about something. So as a result of that, I, I think maybe that helps. That That's how I view you. And uh, we're both uh, grateful that you took the time today. Thanks very much.
it's been great to be on and get into the weeds uh, and talk about this stuff because I wouldn't be able to get into such detail if uh, if this stuff hadn't happened. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That was Professor David Carroll from Parsons School of Design in New York. Well, I hope you found this as interesting as Taylor and I did. Yeah, and let us know what you thought. Use the hashtag Big Tech Podcast on Twitter uh, to talk about this episode. We'll be there. Thanks for listening. I'm David Scott, Editor-in-Chief of The Logic. And I'm Taylor Owen, a CG Senior Fellow and a professor at the Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill. Until next one. Bye for now. The Big Tech Podcast is a partnership between the Center for International Governance Innovation, CG, and The Logic. CG is a Canadian nonpartisan think tank focused on international governance, economy, and law. The Logic is an award-winning digital publication reporting on the innovation economy. Big Tech is produced and edited by Trevor Hunsberger, and Kate Rosewell is our story producer. Visit bigtechpodcast.com for more information about the show. Thank you.